meantime, you have seen already a lot of harmonic analysis or Fourier analysis. I would say you have almost covered uh, the content of the original course that I took when I was a student. Uh, so there's not much more to be said about uh, the classical approach, but I hope to show you a, a number of other sites. Uh, and especially it's one of my claims that when you look up Fourier analysis, uh, then there are many different communities. Uh, I'm just learning myself a little bit about optics applications, uh, but engineers who are doing digital signal processing would start in the discrete domain. Um, uh, mathematicians care about pointwise almost everywhere questions or so. So the common interface between these areas, which are always called Fourier analysis, are not so clear. So I would like to open your view a little bit at the beginning and say, well, what have we achieved within those 200 years since Fourier was making a statement that every periodic function can be expanded? And how far have we come? And uh, just looking at my table, oh yes, I forgot to start this here. Uh, I'm recording something now, uh, voice recording. Uh, I have pictures on my computer. We're sending each other things, files. Uh, and all this is really very much based on Fourier analysis. So. Uh, both the coding of the information, the display, and so on. So I would like to give you some background on this. Now, uh, one of my favorite plots, and I will try to explain a few things with MATLAB uh, some from time to time, is uh, the plot of the Fourier matrix. So in the morning session, we had a short comment that if you apply the FFT to the collection of unit vector, so you would say it's just a unit matrix, it is doing column-wise this. So this simple command, uh, sorry, plot uh, FFT of I of 17, and I was choosing on purpose a mid-size prime number, gives a very nice picture. You would not see such a nice picture if you choose 16, because 16 uh, would be kind of having more symmetries, and then many of these lines would overlap. So really what you could see is this is the plot of the pure frequencies, but in the complex plane. So if you would show the columns individually, you would plot complex curves, and you would see constant one here, well, that's just a point. Second one would be plotting around this. This is just a picture of the unit roots of order 17. So you just have to think, well, divide 360 degree by 17, and then mark these points. So what will be the third column, the third column will be after constant frequency, one full cycle. The third column will be two full cycles. So two full cycles are achieved by starting at one and this line in this color, jumping to the second one, to the second one. There's a brown in my uh, impression or so. And so you're going to, it's e to the two pi i, just uh, the first one is one, 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 one. The second one is from here going through the unit roots up to the 17, 16th orders from 0 to 16. Each node I am treating as the origin and then there yes. I am going everywhere. So you can kind of put nails here and ask a child to take every second, every third, every fifth, then you have a plot in the complex curves. So of course you are saying, okay, I understand the number of oscillation is how often you turn around in the circle. But here you see the really the picture in the circle. Now I'm putting this for different reasons, because it e explains, uh, it makes a connection with, with MATLAB. It makes clear that we have to deal with complex numbers. And somehow I would like to say, well, you know, of course, integration theory, you have seen the integral formulas, but I would like to guide you in extreme explanation from complex numbers, from this great achievement of mankind that somebody invented uh, imaginary units and all these things, but then it's the complex plane and it's again very realistic to Fourier analysis through linear algebra. And linear algebra is, uh, for me, everything that I can do with MATLAB. And how is what we can do with linear algebra terminology using polynomials, complex numbers or so, related to the things that we learn normally about convolution and, and uh, so on. So I will try to make this connection. It will, of course, take a while, but uh, this is the idea. Now, a rough outline of these aspects is in the kind of, this is the far goal I will try to tell you a little bit about function spaces. When you are talking to engineers or so, usually uh, either they say, well, we have an operator, this is a box, and you've inputted output signals. 
and they don't discuss very much the domain or so. Mathematicians maybe are too much obsessed, well, if you have a mapping you have to say what is the domain and so on. The Fourier transform is a kind of something in, in between. When you say, and you can also read such statements, the Fourier trans this object has a Fourier transform. And you have already seen a little bit of discussion about the temporal distributions or so. Then it may not have a, a Fourier transform if you write the integral form of the Fourier transform. And uh, in that case, you may say it's hopeless, you cannot take constant one uh, because it's never integrable. If you integrate constant one against the pure frequency, it's something that has absolute value one. So absolutely no chance to integrate. Actually, what you get out is also not a function. It, would, it should be a Dirac. Again, when you take constant one, then you would get the first element of the Fourier basis. So constant one by this change of basis from the delta basis, from the basis of unit vectors to the discrete Fourier basis would be just take the first basis element and the first basis element is of course one times the first basis element plus zero else. So that's, that's a unit vector. So, oh yes, constant one goes into delta unit vector. Are they the same? And kind of this hand waving where engineers say, well, we think of the deltas as a continuous family of unit vectors well, and then you yeah, think there's a continuous orthonormal system. Okay, so then the scalar product of delta with delta should be one and, and so on, but can I form the scalar product of two deltas? And yeah, then you can have discussions which lead nowhere because you have to really, s you should use distributions. So somehow the, the first point is to tell you a little bit about the landscape of what kind of function spaces appear naturally also in order to tell you at the end, maybe you should not be caught by these technological uh, restrictions or so. Uh, one of the things uh, that will be the goal, not this week, but next week or so, will be to talk about what I call the banach gelfand triple. In short, it's, I do it by analogy with the number systems, but I will tell you. So S0 is, so to say, my version of the Schwartz space. S0 prime is the dual space, which is smaller but uh, similar to the tempered distribution. So for those who have heard about tempered distributions, you will see an alternative which is kind of cheaper uh, but smaller. And sometimes smaller is better because you have more information, you're in a smaller space. Sometimes it's not so good because you cannot do certain things. I cannot do PD with this theory, but if you're an engineer or if you're a person in abstract harmonic analysis, you are not so much eager to do partial differential equations. So I'm not saying that Schwartz is not a good tool, but on the other hand, I sometimes say I have seen my advisor, Hans Reiter, suffer from the schwartz Bruhaus space. So if you know that the Schwartz space is very good and you try to do it in locally compact groups, abelian groups, you expect very, very good properties. So if you have something which is very, very good, but very, very complicated, you're willing to do it. And I was finding this space and then he was asking me questions well, can you prove this and that? And they said, okay, I will look at this and the next day I come here, professor, here, I can prove it, it's half a page or so. And I think, he didn't say he was frustrated, but I think uh, on the one hand, he was happy to see that you can do things better. And he was also using the space and so on. Now, the whole thing has to do a lot with time frequency analysis. And uh, so, uh, we will talk about Gabor analysis, time frequency analysis, spectrogram and, and, and such things. And what I think is that the connection between abstract theory and numerical realization is a topic that will give a lot of people a lot of work to do. I mean, in physics, it's quite clear that people doing uh, differential equations, they do discretization. So I'm not an expert, but let's say finite elements, you have something on the surface, you want to have the impact of some pressure, and then you say, I do triangulations at the uh, delicate points, you have small triangles or so, that allows you to translate the partial differential equation into a corresponding huge difference equation. Then you solve the big system, and once you have solved it, you try to interpret it. But then you have to ask, if you go to finer and finer steps, is it really convergent? So are you not seeing some symptoms coming from the discretization, but are you really solving your problem better and better? And I think that's the best way of, to see 
most of the general problems. Nowadays, when I say I want to do some numerical study of a problem, and I take this functional analytic point of view, then I'm saying, well, you have to tell me in which function space or distribution space you expect your solution to be or your, the solution to your problem. Maybe it's a smooth function or so. Normally, these function spaces are too big to be finite dimensional. So they are infinite dimensional, which essentially says either you choose a basis with infinitely elements, but the better idea is not to choose particular basis, but rather to think we have to apply functional analysis because that's the theory of linear spaces where you don't have finite, dimen uh, finite dimensionality anymore. That's why the norms are so important. You're doing finite dimensional approximation and then you approximate. And sometimes, as we will see, norm approximation is not, cannot be achieved and you have to go to other m actually very natural forms of convergence, which we will also discuss. So this distribution theoretical approach allows us to do things to really describe the situation, how to go from continuous to discrete and back. And so if you have a concrete problem, I would say if you ask the question as an abstract person, you would say, does it have a solution? If you're a more applied person, you would say, can I compute a discrete solution? My favorite example is, well, can I compute 1 over pi squared? And then, of course, you would think a little bit and say, yes, uh, but how many decimals do you need? And that's exactly the way of thinking that I would like to impose on you. Whenever you have such a problem, at least in the long run, we should be able to say, if we need with, uh, the, the answer in some reasonable norm with some given precision, I should be able to tell you how to do it with finite dimensional tools. And uh, the theory should help us to, the, to, to cover the gap between finite dimensional and, and infinite dimensional. And of course, the finite dimensional should be something that I can do. Now, the good thing is, and that's another idea behind these things is, um, and which I call conceptual harmonic analysis, is the idea that for most of the things that you're doing in full analysis, you have many different realizations. So the engineers are learning that you have continuous signals, uh, let's say temperature as a function of time at a given point. You have discrete signals, time series. Every hour you get some data point or so. You have periodic discrete and periodic non-discrete, which is actually what Fourier was saying. He was thinking you have something which is periodic, so you have temperature distribution on a, on a torus, so to say, and then you want to know how it develops and so on, and that's where the nice theory of Fourier series comes up. Now, what abstract harmonic analysis is telling you, well, all these different Fourier transforms, all these different settings have something in common. You start with functions on the group. This group is commutative. You can translate left, right on the integers. You can rotate on the torus. Uh, actually, not to forget, uh, I will use it uh, quite a lot, my little example, so please don't throw it away. Uh, if you have a Gauss function on the torus, this is a function on the torus. So for the ant, an animal which is running around, it's an infinite periodic function. For us, it's an ordinary function. And if I would rotate it, then we have the group operation in the, in the, in the, on the torus or so. And that is, of course, if you would paint everything on the picture, it's a periodic shift. It's so the ordinary shift of a periodic function is a cyclic shift where things come out. And every child can understand if I would use this to paint the wall, uh, you could see a pattern on the wall, and the child could say, what is the pattern on the walls? and it could even read off the period and so on. So we have in abstract harmonic analysis the saying, well, you don't need even to know the details of the group. You are, can be interested in periodic numbers and many other objects. Uh, and then you will have a shift. If you have a shift, there are something like the pure frequencies. I will discuss that in detail. And the pure frequencies allow you to make a full analysis. And depending on the situation, if the group is compact, so torus or finite situation, then the Fourier domain, the pure frequencies, will have, have discrete pattern. Essentially, you will say, well, if you have something which is periodic, you use exponential functions, but only the ones which are fitting to the periodicity make sense. Uh, and that is exactly the story. 
uh, it's more delicate and that's why you have all these problems with integration and so when you have the continuous variable. The pure frequencies are an orthonormal basis in the Hilbert space of square integrable functions on the torus and you have pure frequencies still in the continuous domain but they are not square integrable. So this representation of L2 functions using building blocks which are not in the space is something quite nasty and that's another point where I will come back to this. Pure frequencies are sitting here, deltas are sitting here. Uh, these are so to say the nice function where you really can do everything you want. You can take the Fourier inversion formula and you are, it's pointwise valid so there's no problem. All the classical kernels, all everything that you read in classical books about if a function is decent. It's certainly valid if you have this here. And I will show it, uh, indicate to you that you can use the Schwartz space or this space or L1 intersected L2 to prove Planchorel or so. So we have many different entry points and that's one of the difficulties. I, I would like to guide you through a big landscape of Fourier analysis and there are so many entry points and so many unusual views, hopefully, that uh, we will see how we can do it. Uh, now I will see if I can switch to this. Yeah, uh, I have started uh, in the background and that's something I, I like to do at even at, at popular talks or so. Uh, the program which is called STX. Uh, this is, can be downloaded from the site of the ARI, the Acoustic Research Institute. Uh, the director of this institute is one of my former students who actually first came to me to ask for a topic for the thesis. Uh, this thesis was then on irregular Gabor, but essentially um, uh, about how, what is the mathematical background of MP3. Now, it's a pity that probably none of you has been at the talk on Saturday, which took place here at Chennai. I met Professor Brandenburg, the inventor of MP3, <laughs> on Saturday in the guest house because he was giving a talk and he was introduced as Mr. MP3. He was really the team leader of the group which was setting the MP3 standard. This is a coding standard uh, based on the short time Fourier transform for audio compression or so. And so what is the connection between these things? The connection is I was reading in some technical newspaper about some coding or compression idea by some engineers um, and they used Fourier transform. And I was an abstract guy and I thought, well, interesting, there's application of Fourier transform. I should get to learn what they are doing. And then we agreed that, yes, I can come from Vienna to Erlangen, which is near Munich, so about 500 kilometers. So I said, okay, I take three students and we go there, uh, have a visit to the lab and we let get the explanation of what they are doing. I knew a little bit about the short-term Fourier transform, but it was really kind of an eye-opener. So oh, they're really doing, they're using the FFT, they're taking pieces of an audio signal of length 512, they are doing Fourier transform of it, they move over the signal, so it's really short-term Fourier transform. Now, at that time, this institute, the former boss of the institute, had already started to develop this STX software, really for more or less for scientific purposes. Uh, and so somehow when Peter Balaj was coming for a topic, I thought, well, we have done regular GABA analysis. Maybe we can do irregular GABA analysis. He was a programmer in this institute and wanted with a mathematical degree. So he wanted to do something similar. So, well, at the end, uh, uh, he was doing a nice PhD on this topic. He was having contacts with all the groups. And when his boss retired, he, as a mathematician with application and, of course, a smart person, he was the best person to be chosen as a successor. So he's the director now. And he was then deciding this software, at least the, the, the simple version, should be put up uh, for free because then the people, I mean, general people can understand what they are, do what, what has is been doing. So while this is running, you hear my voice. And it depends on how I raise my voice. So you have different uh, um, patterns in the in the in this time frequency. Uh, I'm passing from left to right, and if I do some other signal, we'll call the frequency chirp. I will try to do it. A frequency chirp would be a signal which is linearly increasing in frequency. So while time is passing, we're trying to raise the 
dominant frequency from low to high. You will see immediately what I mean. So, uh, sorry. This. So, uh, what what this uh, device is doing? Clearly, it's real time. It's doing analysis, and it's you can put the window lengths. So, it's put to. I don't know, some 100 milliseconds probably. Uh, 100 milliseconds is one-tenth of a second. And one-tenth of a second at a sampling rate of 44,100 is about 4,000, FFT of size 4,000. And it's doing that, and because time is in that going in that direction, the frequency spectrum is plotted in that direction. There are other ways of representing it. The point is, what I'm telling you later will not be just abstract mathematics, but it's also something that you can use and that, that uh, has applications or so. Uh, there's another tool that came out just November last year. I have put a link to this on the website, which is called the Gaborator. The Gaborator is essentially a tool where you can look at such spectrograms for some prepared pieces of music, but you can also upload your WAF file. So if you have a WAF file with your favorite piece of music, and actually maybe some of you have some short and nice piece of in, uh, music from India, which is having a characteristic sound. I don't know, either drums or, or some string. So then we could take a look at this. You can upload it. It computes this, though this is not, uh, I mean, it's offline, but it's very quick. And then you can hear the music and see the spectrogram at which place you are. And I think it's very good. You can analyze the characteristics of the sound of a signal. Uh, you can try to find out what the melody was, a kind of in the direction of transcription. And the interesting part is, of course, uh, and that was something that is, uh, was new for those people. Uh, when you have the spectrogram, you can say, OK, I do image processing applications. Uh, if I make some noise, maybe that's another thing that I could do. Or maybe that is not what you like. I did this while you were listening to a concert or so. So what could you do to erase this? Well, you cut out this piece and you go back. But that requires that you are able to come back. And from, to my surprise, the audio people had these spectrograms mostly to analyze, to look at closer and, and so on. But uh, for, for the things which are fitting to audio, they didn't have a way to come back. So this is not exactly Gabor, it's not exactly wavelet theory for those who know about these things. And so if you have this, the scale, scale so the filter bands, so to say, in a way which is adapted to the application, one has to have a way, a mathematical way of having recovery. So in that, in that there's a YouTube talk about the Gaborator or so. Essentially, he says, well, two of, the, of my former students, working, uh, one of them working with Peter Balaj now, uh, have found a way to implement this, I mean, to describe it mathematically. And this person has implemented it in, in, in good programming language, made it accessible. But I think it's very good because then you can say, what we are doing has relevance for, for real life or so. I mean, you can uh, uh, get interest from, from the side of students and also you're not completely lost. So I'm going back now uh, to the slides. Yeah, so uh, in the popular talk on 22nd, I think, I will talk a little bit more about, so to say, the history of Fourier analysis, uh, the applications of Fourier analysis, and what else can be done. But you have seen already now, uh, this history is 200 years old. My usual way of saying it, it took about 100 years until people knew what a function is. So the modern concept of function is a mapping is not what, what, what Fourier had in mind at that time. Uh, functions were, let's say, sine, cosine or so, maybe step functions which you could describe. 
explicitly, analytically, uh, but not this idea of somebody is giving you a non-measurable function. Yes, they exist. Otherwise, uh, if, if you would not have non-measurable functions, you could assign a volume to every subset in the three-dimensional space uh, in such a way that this volume doesn't change if you move the object. And there's this, there are the famous examples where you say, well, using Torn's lemma, you can provide uh, a function, uh, well, you can define sets. Usually people say, I can take an orange, divide it into infinitely uncountably many pieces, measure all the pieces, move them around, and I get three oranges out of it. And so that clearly contradicts the idea of a volume assignment to arbitrary sets. But this is because the idea of a set and of a function, as we have learned it, is so general that it just says, if there is a well-defined assignment of an x, f and the value f of x for every given x, and how complicated the assignment is, as long as it's logically well-defined, is okay. And that's, of course, far beyond what one needs for practical purposes. Of course, we shouldn't say every function has to be continuous or every function has to be infinitely smooth. That would be the other extreme or so. But we have, with the beginning of the last century, uh, the work of Lebesgue, and then we know that there is an L1 space, and the L1 space has all the good properties also that we have seen uh, this morning or, or in the last few days. Uh, uh, and the main property being, compared to the Riemann integral, if you take the integrable functions, they are complete. So you have Banach spaces. So it's the same spirit that you say, why are the real numbers so much better? Also, they are so complicated. I mean, infinite decimal expression, ordinary fractions, rational numbers are good. 3 over 4, inverse 4 over 3. Pi, 1 over pi. Uh, what is 1 over pi? It's a long procedure and, and so on. Right? But once you have a calculus, you're happy to do it. So L1 is a Banach algebra, and we will most of the time use what has been already used as a principle. Reduce yourself to a dense subspace where you really can do things in the way how you would do it, or where you do the Fourier transform as an integral transform, and then expand in an abstract way by regularizing it, by moving to a s safe territory, so to say. So, um, and we have seen some of these pr so properties. I have also made now for in the script a list of the operators that we use, and uh, uh, certainly one of the scopes of the, of the uh, course will be to go from functions uh, to distributions and kind of skip LP theory. So LP theory is kind of well established and it's in many books. That, that's one of the, it's uh, not, not saying it's, it's useless or so, but I'm saying it's not something that I have to explain in gr great lengths because this is well described in many places. Other aspects have to be de explained in more detail. Now, uh, a good example uh, for, for the uh, general idea of this so-called banach gelfand triple is coming from the number system. I have already given some indications. Uh, and actually, it was at some point my daughter was saying, uh, now it's cool, we have learned yet another system of numbers. And uh, they had to do conversion of periodic uh, decimal expressions into rational numbers and vice versa. Or so. so, yes, mathematicians say, well, don't worry, I mean, it's just the same. But at the end, uh, that is really something different. So it's much better before you say it's clear that the rational numbers are in the real numbers are in the complex numbers. You're explaining rational numbers are really something different. These are these funny things upstairs, downstairs, and so denominator and so. And you have a not so easy addition, but it's okay. You know how to do that. But it's very nice to 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 do inversion. And I like to to use this as analogy to Fourier transform. If you have a nice function, the Fourier inversion theorem is easy. You do the integral once more and you're back. And that's the same spirit with inversion. Now, the numbers are, have good properties. They are a field, as we know, but they're not complete. And that means that when I say I have a good approximation to something that has a, a, pr uh, a square which is close to 2. So I'm talking about square root of 2 is irrational, but since I'm supposed not to talk about real numbers while I'm living in the world of rational numbers, I'm saying, well, I try to find a number, a rational number, where the square is 2. 1 squared, that's too small. 2 squared, it's too big. So let's try 1.1, 1 1.2. 1 and so 
after a while you see, well, there's always a decimal expression which is small and another next step which is jumping over two. And then, of course, if you are in a complete field like the real numbers as we know it, you would say, well, you take the infinite decimal expression. And I would say, yes, you approximate, approximate, and you get something, and this something call, is called square root of two, and this number has a multiplicative inverse, which you multiply, which you call one over square root of two, and all the things work fine. So if you go in the technicalities of how you do the computation, you, you're a little bit more, it's subtle, uh, but we use it in MATLAB, we use it in the, co in the computer, uh, in, in the pocket uh, calculator, so, so it's not a big thing. And again, in reality, we should say we don't need uh, so many digit, uh, uh, digits. So when we have uh, square root of two and we see on the, on, the, on the display a certain number of decimals, we are ha quite happy. We actually believe that we are seeing pi or square root of two or so, uh, but we are seeing a truncated version and we are satisfied with it. And if somebody needs a better approximation, it's fine. So there are these two ideas coming from, uh, and I will come back very often to this idea. Uh, rational numbers are easy because you can invert. Real numbers are good because they are complete. And then there are these complex numbers, where if you try to explain them in a naive way, you're saying, well, I cannot solve x squared equals minus 1. So I, I call i the square root of minus 1, and then everything works fine. So come on, I mean, I can always wish things. Why do I know that it's not contradictive or so? I can also say, well, I try to s understand the multiplication of complex numbers. That's where I have, a, a not, not for now, but I have prepared a Georg Geber file or so. You can explain a 15-year-old kid easily, well, there is something like multiplication of points in the plane or so, and then they play around and say, oh, yes, if, if you take points, you multiply with points in the, in the unit circle, it means that everything that you have multiplied is rotated. If you do something on the line, you have to do the same thing and say, oh, it's scaled, you're magnifying. So everybody understands that there is a group of rotations combined with dilations. And the surprising thing is that if you rotate first and you stretch afterwards, it's the same as stretching first and dilating. So, oh, we have a commutative group. What I told you just now is, of course, nothing else but the polar decomposition of the complex numbers, if you do it by hand or so. But it's the rotation group, I mean, stretching with rotation. And, and many things can be explained from this viewpoint. So the point is, how can we deal with the complex numbers? I would say in many different ways. One is the point in the plane. Uh, polar decomposition is a different thing or so. We need some rules. If we say it's pairs of real numbers, for example, then in, from the idea that if it was this formal symbol, A plus imaginary unit, well, do we know if it exists or not? Well, we, we can write it B. We would get some rules, and we put these intuitive rules as definitions. And we have to check that in this way we get a field. I mean, taking away the zero, we get a multiplicative group. And then we have something which is a field. And then, of course, we have to say, what are the real numbers? Clearly, these are the points on the axis. The, the complex numbers with zero imaginary part are the complex numbers. This is a very easy identification. But you have two identifications. Once you have a correct description of the big object, meaning the complex numbers, you need rules how to handle them. And then there comes another important point, which is the embedding. Oh, no, maybe I come to this a little bit later. You have to s be sure that it, doesn't, it never matters where you jump from one viewpoint to another viewpoint. So of course you can computations win in the rationals, or you can, uh, well, I think I have a slide later on, or you can convert to decimals to the computations at, with decimals, convert back or so, and it should never, uh, kind of, which path you take should not matter. You have always the same symbols. You use, always use a plus and, the, and the, uh, the multiplication sign or a division sign or so. And the interpretation within the identification is the same. So if you're happy, you have a problem in the real numbers, you're walking around in the complex domain. At the end, the result is something with imaginary part zero. 
And then you throw, I mean, if, if some complex numbers are equal, the real and the imaginary parts have to be equal. And then suddenly you have a real equation. And that's, of course, the way how I would suggest to define, uh, to, to derive the, the addition law for cosine and sine. So that, that's one of the things. Okay, so um, we have this uh, way of looking at the, the real and complex numbers. Uh, it's having an inverse. And we have the great thing that now, because of the combined thing that we can do multiplication and we can do limits, we can write out what e to a complex number is. So just, of course, you, you know the power series expansion. You write e to the power set is a sum with the factorials. They're growing so fast that everybody can check that for every complex number, this is a well-defined complex number. Uh, I think it is a good exercise and I would suggest that you try to, to verify it uh, because it's something that I must say uh, I've used so for decades or so and after a while I said, well, when have I heard it? Have I ever checked myself? Uh, probably as a student I was trusting my professors that this is valid and it's very plausible or so, but now kind of try to convince yourself why this is true and what kind of arguments you need to verify it. I think it w I would be happy to have some discussion maybe next week at one of the tutorials what kind of suggestion you have if uh, some of you say, well, it's easy, I have done this in, in three courses already or, or well, no, I've never thought about it, I always was told that this is true. But the point is, this is valid and one can do it from scratch without too big, big difficulties. And um, yes, this is just reminding me of what I don't want to go now here is uh, the analogy with these real imaginary numbers is if you would say I said S some number is pi square and then uh, you are multiplying pi with 1 over S uh, and you expect that it's 1 over pi. It's just su such a thing where you would say no, the correct thing is I can define a number in the real number system which I get as a limit of the truncations of pi and so on. Then I take the multiplicative inverse, then I do the multiplication in this way and that this is the same real number that I would get in this way is, of course, trivial from a, from a symbolic point of view. But if you really do the truncation, so I've really played around a little bit with MATLAB. I have a little command doing quantization or so. To quantize up to, uh, let's say, three digits or four digits and then multiply the quantized version or to multiply out and then quantize, quantize after multiplying out, which means Actually, in MATLAB, I never do the infinite product, but I have a very long product, and I look at the relevant decimals. You find out that, of course, it's not exactly the same, but if you do the quantization later and later, more and more significant letters will appear. So it's exactly in this spirit that you say, yes, of course, I can test it, and whatever precision you need, I can, I can verify it up to that precision. This spirit is what we will do with distributions. If you hear it's a Dirac, then you should say, oh, approximate it with a Gaussian approximation. And if it's not good enough, I have to make my Gaussian smaller and smaller. And this spirit will be uh, provided. So uh, MATLAB has been mentioned. I think I don't uh, go into this now. Yeah, maybe the only thing is the uh, viewpoint of abstract harmonic analysis is that you can do uh, full analysis on any locally compact abelian group and we have seen that you can do it on the torus and then you have the functions on this torus here. So if you look at the baseline you would say this is your torus and my Gauss function is centered here where so this is one for you and you would say okay the parameterization is e to the 2 pi x and uh, yeah two, and because the 2 pi is in the exponent I really think that the, there are good reasons choosing this normalization. Then when t is reaching 1, uh, then you have uh, done a full circle because the circumference of the unit circle is 2 pi, of course. Uh, now, when you start to discretizing it, it's clear that you will do a sampling of the unit circle in equidistant points. And therefore, it's plausible that you will work with the unit roots of order n. You can view them as rotations. Very often I'm using n equals 8 for explanations or for drawing pictures on the black spot because 45 degree are easy to, to do. So unit roots of, four, uh, of order 8 are easy to, to plot and depict or so. 
And then, of course, it's addition of angles. Everybody knows if you rotate three times by 180 degrees, it's like one times because the 360 full circles don't count. Or you do addition modulo n. That's the other way of doing it. That's why it's called set n. Uh, and I've already mentioned the different cases where you have uh, uh, domains. Now, especially in the last few uh, years now, I have to read a lot of engineering papers, engineering books, books about signal processing, and I think it's also healthy because then you learn that uh, 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 these engineers would rather not write f, but f of t, g of x, h of omega. They would emphasize that this is very important for the dimensionality, the comparison of dimension or so. Uh, and I would say, yes, it's good, but we would rather say it's a function and the domain is maybe the real lines. So we have seen all, all the definition that we have seen is, we were, these were mostly about fun complex valued function on the real line. Why complex valued functions? Because we have to do a Fourier transform and we will run into complex valued things anyway. So even if the engineer tells us, I'm only interested in real valued function, he will receive, doing Fourier analysis, complex valued functions. Or he will do some trick by using symmetry properties and so on, that's a different thing. But Essentially, the explanation, the theory is much more smooth and also more general if you do it with complex exponentials. And therefore, uh, it's uh, good if you know the domain, but you should not always write it with, with, uh, as, as an argument. We, al we also would say f is the name of the function. And uh, uh, we will have, uh, I will use uh, these symbols for the operators. I have slightly different symbols, but that will come in a moment. If you have a symbol, an operator, like a shift operator, assume this is the function, the shifted version will look like this. So this new function has a name, and that will be t of x, and the operation which moves this function here to here is a name. And if you ask, what is the value of this function, and I'll have to do it in this way, what is the value here, then we say, go back by so much, and then you will read off the value from this. And when you read the engineering books, you would they would just write f of x minus tau or so. And so when you see the symbol, you have to think, well, if there is the symbol x minus tau, <coughs> then this is a shifted thing. And therefore, it's. I think it's much better to say, well, there are this function and this function. I can take the function, move it over here. And what is, the, what is this operation doing? And of course, everybody without knowing integration knows the area under the graph is not changing. You would say the L1 norm is preserved, the L2 norm is preserved, and all these things. You shift it a little bit, the function doesn't change too much. That was what we needed today to prove the riemann lebesgue lemma. So it's getting some nice pictures also in, in, in our brain. OK, so uh, uh, I have a few other things to just remind you. Uh, I'm making a distinction in, in, in when I do definitions about the, what I call, minim there's a general viewpoint, minimalistic axiomatic viewpoint and practical viewpoint. When you want to know what linearity means, usually you say it's compatible with addition or it's, and it's compatible with scalar multiplication. If you combine and you get the first line, if you do induction, of course, what you do, then you get it's compatible with linear combinations. So when you're asking me, how can I verify that the function is linear? Of course, I take the axiomatic minimalistic. I'm making a test if this is a good candidate, and if it passes, that's a good mapping. It's a linear one. If I'm working with things, what are the properties? I'm not each time saying I have to redo the induction proof. I'm saying, well, because it's linear, I can interchange with, with linear combinations. So that's one of the things uh, that I wanted to tell you. And when you're doing this now in the finite dimensional case, we have matrices. So you say, I know what the basis vectors are doing. I write the result into a columns of a matrix, and then I know everything. And one of the difficulties also in continuous signal processing is you would like to do the same thing in the continuous domain. And I've already mentioned this delta, the collection of deltas, and usually it's called the sifting properties of the delta, and you write the function as an integral with the over the deltas or so. So somehow it's, you're thinking, well, uh, the function is the collection of all its values. That's our definition or so. Uh, 
if you want to do matrix multiplication in a continuous setting, you're getting these symbols here. So it looks like f of y is a continuous column vector, k of x, y is a continuous two-dimensional matrix, and you're doing row column multiplication. So somehow, if somebody is giving you a decent kernel, and such a decent kernel to some extent could have the form k of x, y equals e to the minus 2 pi i x, y, then we would talk about the Fourier transform. And it's kind of, what well, I would say it's semi-decent. It's decent because it's smooth. Can I apply it to an L2 function? Mm. Somehow the operator is defined, but I cannot write the integral, this Lebesgue integral. So you, you see already, it may be a problem with the, this. But the the absolutely, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, <coughs> I will correct it. So, uh, of course, tf of x is uh, this, and then you can ask: Is every operator can every operator be written in this form? And then somehow you remember uh, the fact that how can you write a multiplication operator? So, the coordinate-wise multiplication of a vector x with, let's say, y. So x is multiplied in x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on. Oh, it's a diagonal matrix. Just write the values in the diagonal. So, OK, I have to take a kernel in the continuous domain, uh, smooth continuous functions concentrated on the diagonal. OK, that will be difficult. The diagonal is a set of measure 0. So somehow, that's one of the examples where you see a multiplication operator is never written as an integral operator with a locally integrable kernel. And that's why essentially we need something like a Dirac-like form, but a Dirac stretched out on the main diagonal or so. And to have terminology in this sense, it will be one of the goals of this distribution theory. Now I'm just recalling the operators that we use all the time. So I mentioned we will do time frequency analysis. And time frequency analysis, uh, one informal definition is all the things in analysis that you can do using the time shift and the frequency shifts. And as I mentioned, when you are in a local living on a locally compact abelian groups, you have natural time shifts. It's just instead of RD, you write G. And you also will find that there are enough pure frequencies, so certain functions with values in the torus, so that you can define modulation operators. So for the course, I will stay with RD, which has some advantages aside from being concrete. It has the advantage that I can use the Gauss function and I can use uh, dilations. Normally on a group, I do not have dilations. Imagine even a discrete signal or a function on the torus. How should I dilate it? I mean, it's compact. I mean, being in India now, I must say, maybe we should inflate the, the globe, then we have more space for all the people. <laughs> we cannot do it, it's compact. <laughs> yeah, so uh, there is no dilation, and I have, and that's uh, in a slight uh, conflict with the notations that uh, we have used so far. I have used, I'm using this notation. Uh, D, I use the letter D for dilation, and I have another letter for stretching. So this is, I don't remember now your, Scaling and so so we have to be careful, but it's uh, we will see in a moment. Yeah, that uh, we have actually not just individual operators, but we have groups. Of course, you can compose a shift with another shift. It doesn't care. I mean, t x combined with t y is t y of x plus y, and you can change the order. That doesn't matter. You can. Uh, stretch by a factor of 3, then by 5. It's the same as 5 by 3, and it's 15. So these are what I would call commutative group of operators. So if you apply these operators, you can even choose many of the function spaces, and you can say there are even groups of operators which each of them is unitary. Well, ex well I was, let's say maybe I, I leave out the dilation for a moment. So time shift and frequency shifts are unitary commutative groups of unitary operators. And they're not just groups, so it's not like you give me one, you give me another. As I have shown you, I mean, if I shift by, let's say, 5 and 7, the result will be 12, which is exactly 5 plus 7 is 12. So you have 
the indexing is our elements from the group of real numbers, I mean from the underlying group where I'm starting, and the mapping from now, from the symbol x to the operator is again having nice properties. You can take x1 plus x2, and that will be describe the operator tx composed with ty. So we really have a group representation, a homomorphism, addition of parameters is going to composition of operators. That's something also quite good. And there's a typo where it should be a row. And uh, we have also clearly then laws that on the one hand they are unitary, therefore the, the transpose is the, the inverse. But you can also do it by applying it with the inverse element in the group where the parameter is coming. Everybody knows if you shift to the right, then you have to shift back to the left. If you do the same in the frequency, of course, it's the same. If you stretch, you have to compress, and, and that's, that's quite clear. So you have uh, these laws, and here is my second. Uh, so I, I decided a long time ago to use two different uh, dilation operators, and I call the one with, uh, with the row in the denominator plus an extra factor, I call this the stretching operator. In German, the word stretch is strecken, and uh, if I do the opposite of strecken, which means compress, it's stauchen. So it, in German, it's almost perfect symbol for, um, I call it area preserving operator because it has this important property that the integral of this new function, so you have not, you should not read it as st is applied to f of y, but it's just you take the graph, for example, a rectangular function, and then you compress it by a factor of two. The rectangular function will have half width and double height. So this is the compensation. And then, so it's area preserving, and of course, because the absolute value is no problem, it's also L1 norm preserving. So the ST row operator, as we will see, is very well adapted to the L1 norm, whereas the dilation operator will be very well adapted to the sup norm. I mean, somebody says, what is the sup norm of a function? Well, take the supremum over all the values. Uh, I cannot do it now, but uh, if you have a complex valued function, how do you uh, visualize the, the, uh, su the, the sup norm? You take the modulus, yeah. So, okay, so you take the modulus and then you look at the maximum of the modulus. So probably you would say, if I have a complex valued function like a Fourier transform or so, I, I want to take a look at the Fourier transform absolute and then I look at the highest bar. There, but there's another way, uh, at some point I will show you. I can, of course, say I plot in the complex plane. So I have a curve in the complex plane. A trigonometric polynomial is really closed curve in the complex plane. So if somebody is showing you such a curve, you can say, well, how big is it? So kind of you enclose it into a ball of radius r and you make it so small until it touches the graph. And that's the size of the graph. So the sup norm is something quite, quite nice. And of course, if somebody says, I was running through this curve at a different speed, that's the reparameterization, then it's just different labels, but it's the same graph and the same sup norm. It means trivial, of course. Dilation in the, in the sense of changing the values only by uh, by using the other argument is not changing the sup norm. So the sup norm, and let's see the Fourier algebra norm, of course, is also then okay. Uh, I think I can leave out. Oh, yes, now, now I'm coming to another point that w I will address occasionally. So uh, at the moment, I mean, the first part until the break, I will do a lot of general comments and not real mathematics. Uh, Having looked at many of the books, and I'm still continuing to do so, and I would even suggest that if you have some f nice, strange formula where you say, well, how can they do it? Or uh, I tried to understand it, or I, tried, I had to explain it to some colleague, and he wasn't satisfied with my explanation because I told him, first, you have to learn Lebesgue integration. Or so then maybe I find some nice other examples, because sometimes people are really getting bad explanations or they explain correct things in the incorrect way so it's not really convincing and, and I will show you some of these things. Uh, the first thing is 
the so-called sifting properties of the, of the uh, delta. So I, I don't tell you what the delta is here, uh, but this is one of the fundamental things. So when you look or analyze how they're using it, it's really in the spirit of linear algebra. They're saying, well, if you have a linear system, you know, I know what the T of this shifted delta is or so, and then I put everything together, and because of linearity, well, it's an integral, but it's an integral is a continuous sum or so, and I pull it through or so. And very rarely they say, well, is the system even allowing, we would say, is the delta in the domain of the operator? So can I even throw a delta into the system? And if it's okay, how would you write such an integral? I would approximate it by Riemannian sums. In which sense do the Riemannian sums converge or so? And whereas I was kind of trying to avoid these things for a long time, nowadays I'm saying no, kind of proactive. I try to give explanations which keep the spirit of these formulas intact. Uh, and, uh, and, and allow them to interpret them, because especially people in theoretical physics are using very much similar formulas, and they are not completely strange or wrong, but uh, they can be used or so. Now, another, I find even more curious uh, statement is this formula. I will discuss this quite in some detail. Uh, in one blog, I was reading a very nice question which fits very well to the course. Uh, Somebody was complaining, said, well, I had a course in Fourier analysis or probably in signal processing or so, and we, we learned that uh, there is a Fourier transform, and we also learned that if you change the sign, if you put a plus, then, it's, then this is the inverse transform. But I remember in the mathematics course, we were told that the inverse of a mapping is mapping x to y, then the inverse mapping is mapping y back to x. So just writing something and calling it an inverse is not a justification or so. And then there's a, the blog was having some discussion and the final answer was somebody was saying, well, you know what I have learned in the course, this is based on this formula. Because this formula is true, uh, this is the inverse. And I think this is turning around the arguments. I mean, in that sense, I'm very happy about the, the kind of the, uh, the preamble or the first part of the course. We have seen that you have to be careful to do the, to prove the inversion theorem or so. So it's really this integral kernel for the Fourier transform and for the inverse Fourier transform, somehow one could combine it. If you think of matrix multiplication, you would say, well, matrix multiplication is going like that, rows going with columns. So I would suggest try out, take the forward Fourier kernel, the inverse Fourier kernel, try to compose them, use the exponential law, then you come to this here. And then you would say, okay, it should be the identity, or we have proved, I mean, of course, we have proved it's the identity. We, how would you describe the identity in a continuous setting? You would say, well, it's the thing which, if you have a fixed row, if you hit the diagonal, then it's a delta. So it's exactly this fact that you are picking out the delta and you're viewing this integral kernel, which is really a distribution, as something which is a continuous collection. If you look at it row-wise, it's a delta. I would just say it's another way of saying you have a mapping which has a description. You have another mapping if you have a description. And the composition of these two mappings is identity. So what I would do to justify this, I would say you have to smooth everything mollify it with Gauss functions, localize it with Gauss functions, and then you would see something which is almost like a, a, a delta on the main diagonal. So probably I would explain it to you, it's a kind of very narrow Doppleroni-like thing on a long part of the diagonal. If you do a better job, it's even more narrow and even longer, and in the limit it would be a delta, which is the distribution which on the test function integrates along the diagonal. That's what, what really happens here. So, what is the conclusion of this philosophical comment? When engineers are using this formula, it's a formal object. And in a way, it's like, if I multiply pi with 1 over pi, it's 1. Is it wrong? Uh, so, it's not wrong. It's, it's giving a, a correct calculation. But to say, what I have to do is I have to write the kind of that would be my analog of, of, of what, what one thinks one should do. 
pi divided by 1 over pi is you write the infinitesimal expression in a, in a, in a fraction. And you write the other downstairs. And then, you, you, then you, you claim that you can divide through and it's clear that it cancels out. No, it's a complicated procedure and you can do it approximately better and better and the limit you do something which is reasonably described by delta. And of course, as with numbers, you should not all the time make troubles and so, uh, but I think to first explain how important it is to have integration theory and then to write this, which is not even a function, and, and to say oh, it's clear, I mean, when you take s equal 1, it's clear this is, this is uh, constant 1. So integrating 1 from over the whole line, that's plus infinity. So it's actually very easy to prove that this is a delta. It's plus infinity for s equal 1 and, and it's oscillating, so it's cancelling out, so it's 0 elsewhere. So this is, this is the delta. But then I'm asking, well, and if you put 3 times this, I'm getting 3 times infinity. Is 3 times delta the same as delta? And then, of course, it's not true. So that's why it's dangerous to, to have this simple-minded thing. People who are thinking in physical terms, they would say, I have a point mass or have three point masses. I mean, the, 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 the amplitude is the, ma of the mass of three atoms is concentrated in one point, a triple charge in one point, or negative charge. That's meaningful. So one has another way of explaining what these deltas are. Of course, they are these distributions and we have to deal with them. Yeah, there is another thing. Uh, uh, delta is the unit for convolution, and we've seen in L1 you do not have a unit, but in this has the inverse Fourier transform of this uh, is the delta is more or less the formula that uh, I was writing before. So this is more or less applying formally the inverse Fourier transform to constant 1. And the statement that the extended Fourier transform of constant 1 is the Dirac, that's absolutely okay. Only to say the inverse Fourier transform is writing an integral. It's not okay. Interpreting the integral as a way of writing it, the inverse Fourier transform is okay. So I would say, whenever you see this, you think of distributions because it cannot be an integral transform, it's fine. To say, we like these integrals so much. And why do they like the integrals so much? Because it's clearly that integrals satisfy the superposition principle, so they are linear. We would say, no, when you use linearity, tell it. So F, the Fourier transform, the ordinary extended work are linear operators. So what is the domain? Can I apply the operator? Is it linear? What are the steps? What kind of manipulations are allowed at which step? And we will have recipes of these things. Uh, and uh, one thing which I realized by discussions with some other colleague, uh, which was in some sense conf uh, pro producing confusion, is uh, you can even look up Wikipedia about the Dirac delta function. And uh, um, I had a hard time to understand this formula number 10. So it was there a few days ago, so I, I think it will be there for a while. It's, it's very confusing because people would, I mean, first of all, what is this delta psi minus x and so on? We would think you have a Dirac mass. And when you shift it, it's like shifting the arguments or you're translating. So we will, we will, I will show you, you extend the translation operator from ordinary functions to, to other functions. It should be consistent. Well, instead of compressing my Gauss function, I take this Gauss function, move them over, and compress them here. There's also a limit, and that, that's what they call delta of psi minus x. So that would be a delta at x. But in the way how, and then they say, and the rest is, integral and the shift is essentially a convolution. So what they want to say is, in my terminology, a delta at zero convolved with a delta at eta is delta at eta. This is quite reasonable. Uh, uh, and I will tell you in probability theory, it's if somebody has a, a random variable with definite uh, output zero, and you add something which, uh, well, if a function which values zero, and you add the value eta, then you get zero plus eta is eta. So that's as easy as it is. So this will be completely easy, will be a special case of this, but in the above case, you would ask yourself, okay, I have to multiply two deltas, especially for 
for delta equals zero, it's very difficult. I mean, delta zero convolved with delta zero is delta zero. Yes, this is true because it's the identity. The identity operator three times is the same. That's meaningful. But to write it as integrals, pretending that you have to multiply pointwise deltas, then integrate the result is rather bad. And what I'm saying again is uh, one should try to avoid these things. Whenever you see these things, and you, as a mathematician, you would like to know, is it correct or not? Try to apply the machinery of reducing it to something that you can follow up. Try to take the limit. And if, if you take the product of Gauss functions and do a pointwise multiplication, it will, it will explode. You will get, so to say, infinitely times delta zero. You could say infinitely times infinite is infinite. So how, what can be worse than infinite? Well, there is a big difference. I mean, a sequence n times delta is zero will be exploding, will not be convergent as functional, and so on. OK, now, uh, I think I have something like 20 minutes or so. Yeah, uh, it's good because now I can show you uh, some of the rich collection of pictograms that I have developed over the years uh, for the different function spaces. So the very the starting point was that uh, some students were complaining that I have, I'm using so many function spaces. And my answer was, no, it's not so many function spaces. Let's make a list. And yes, it's many function spaces. And we have seen already some of these function spaces. And I will try to explain to you now what the symbols are and why I was choosing these symbols. So the yellow sun that you see here is L2. The Hilbert space is the perfect space. Good, whenever you can get the Hilbert, I mean, general recommendation for doing analysis or functional analysis, whenever you can get the Hilbert space, try to invoke it because the Hilbert space is nice. You have orthogonality. Operators on Hilbert space are nice. Self-adjoint operators have spectral decompositions. You're getting for free or automatically orthonormal basis for the space. You can uh, diagonalize symmetric operators and so on. OK, so it's nice. And, and this, of course, corresponds to the fact that in the two-dimensional Euclidean space, the unit ball of L2 is just the, the, the circle that you see here. Now, if you take the L1 norm, so in the, in the plane, the L1 norm would be absolute value of x1 plus absolute value of x2. And I would draw the unit circle. That means all the functions, all the vectors in the plane and of two variables. Then you would see a caro. So it would be symmetric. Now, I have designed these things so that when you apply the Fourier transform, the symbol should be rotation by 90 degree. This has to do with the fact that uh, doing a Fourier transform four times gives you the identity. So rotation four times by 90 degree gives the identity. So if I would have chosen a symbol like this, then I would have implied that the Fourier transform is leaving L1 invariant. And we have seen this is not the case. It's this is really one of the big troubles. We are starting with L1 to allow integration, and we're ending up with a space which is not inside of L1. And we have to pull ourselves into L1. And therefore, we have to make choose a symbol which is slightly uh, different. And uh, I also had this idea that sometimes, if you have these symbols, uh, the left and right is like my spectrograms, is time, and the other one is frequency. So if you look, even just take, uh, yeah, so here, here the green symbol is FL1. So inside this rotated rhomb or so, you have this, the, the idea is you should think of these are all the functions that you can have in the Fourier transform domain. So what are these functions here outside of the yellow domain? These are L1 functions which are not uh, uh, square integrable. So that could be functions which are cusp-like. So a cusp with a finite area between the y-axis and, and this. So some negative exponent x to the alpha. You have just to choose the right range, which is still finite area. But when you square it, it is exploding. You also see, of course, that there are functions which are in the yellow domain, which are not in the blue domain. So these are functions which are uh, uh, square integrable, but not integrable. And you have seen this nice splitting of a function in LP into two parts. Take it into the big and the small part. 
So when you have inclusions in one direction, the little guys which explode are bad. If you are having now the opposite uh, inclusion, you take functions which are decaying, which mostly have small values. Why? Small values are getting even better when you square it. Everybody knows that from, zero, fr from 1 to infinity, 1 over x is not summable. The harmonic, if you st take step functions, harmonic series is divergent. If you take the squares, no problem. 1 over n squared is fine. So this would be the, fu the functions. And because this is global behavior, so the yellow on this side, they are a bit more to the side. They have <laughs> good global behavior, as a bad, bad global behavior, so in that direction. Whereas these, for me, are indicating that these are the rough functions, which are too rough. They're exploding, and if you square them, they are out of the space. And another joke I'm making is, maybe you don't see very well. I mean, this is a good beamer, I would say. The green lines or so. Uh, but sometimes it's very hard to find out whether the function is in the Fourier algebra. People occasionally say, we cannot find a good criterion whether a function, a I mean, the zero, uh, they are all in C0. But if you give me a function in C0 when it's in the Fourier algebra, it's hard to de determine or so. So it's actually also not even completely easy to find an example of a continuous function which is not uh, in, in the Fourier algebra. I mean, I can show you some ideas how to get it. Uh, there's a book of, uh, I think, Goldberg about Fourier series. Uh, where, where you can find a very explicit example or so. So yes, there are examples, of course. Now, just to augment this situation, so the inner part is more or less what we have seen. Now with one little guy in the middle, this wiggles. Uh, another challenge, I'm, all these things have been done with MATLAB. Uh, and so I'm really plotting a trigonometric polynomial and this trigonometric polynomial has only two, uh, two coefficients. I leave it to you to play around a little bit to find out. But if you think, how would you do such a plot? Probably you would do it in such a way. Yeah? And if you say, well, I have a, a center, and the move center is moving like this, which is the low frequency, and I have an epi epicentric movement, so to say, then you have already a very good idea. So you can even find out, you can count how many loops I have taken, and then you can find at which frequency I'm putting this. If you change it, and of course you can uh, kind of change it so that it would be like this. So I to have choose the radius so that it's really nicely overlapping. Why did I choose such an object? Well, we have seen the Schwartz space. This is the Schwartz space for me. Uh, it's small. It's inside L1, L2, L and so on. And all the spaces have common domain, which is dense in, in every one. So that, that's not the, the issue. Uh, but it's not such an easy space with a nice, s smooth contour, so to say. It's more complicated. I cannot have infinitely many, but that would be the natural thing. Why? Because if you look at this, and you and if I was choosing an even number. So when you rotate by 90 degree, you would say, oh yes, it's, it's going back to itself. So this indicates that the Schwartz space is allowing rotation by 90 degrees. So it's fully invariant, as we have seen. And other question, how would you, what kind of picture would you choose for the dual space? How, how do you think it could come from this to this one? Yeah, but uh, yeah, reflection is the right thing. Yeah. So instead of uh, everything which is going outward is going inside. So more or less I was reflecting it. And that's already also giving the spirit of the banach gelfand triple later on. And now it's a gelfand triple. So that's where the name gelfand triple comes from. That people realized sometimes it's not enough to look at the Hilbert space. But you should look at some space inside the Hilbert space, and that allows you, if it's a good space, like the Schwartz space, to go beyond it. And very often people say, because I need to deal with the Dirac, we have to make this huge territory. I would argue, if you are interested in PDE, you have to do it, learn it, read books of Hermander and so on, perfect thing, and the topological vector space theory cannot be avoided or so. But if you're 
kind of in between and you're having some uh, uh, things closer to this period of digital process signature processing, abstract harmonic analysis, there is uh, the time frequency viewpoint is okay. And the other thing is we even can, once you have this simple banach von triple that you will hopefully learn in this course, you can say, well, but can I do weighted versions of it? Then you get into what I call modulation space theory, and then you can recover Schwartz theory in a different way. So it's essentially the, the idea, which we cannot develop here, that you can have another system of, of seminorms where each of the seminorms is fully invariant. So in the proof uh, that we have seen, the indication is more or less, you can show that for every derivative on the free transform side, you have some control or so. But it's because you have a rich reservoir of seminorms. If somebody is interested in some derivative with some multiple polynomial, you can control it by some other one. And the whole family is, one member from the original family is controlling a given member from the new uh, problem, so to say. Whereas I'm saying here with, with this theory, we have kind of weighted versions of these circles and we kind of go down and it's, it's, it's an alternative. For those who have heard about Schubin classes, this might be a topic for discussions separately. Okay, now just riemann lebesgue of course, the unit circle for the supremus norm would be a box. And again, I have to stretch it because we want to have the Fourier algebra inside this. So when we talk about the Fourier transform, uh, we have this situation. And now, just to mention it, uh, to fiddle around with the, with the uh, dimensions of these things so that all the inclusions that I am aware of are correctly represented, it was not so easy. So you see what I had to do is to stretch the green area so that there is a little corner uh, which is outside the Fourier algebra. So what I'm using here, and unfortunately there is a duplication of terminology again, what I call the Wiener algebra, I will explain it in, in great detail. This is more or less uh, the functions that uh, have uh, absolutely convergent upper Riemannian sums. So when you are on the real line, you make a partition into unit intervals from n to n plus one, you make the upper Riemannian sum, but not just from a to b, but from minus infinity to plus infinity. So if you have a continuous function where this upper Riemann sum is finite, you are in this space, uh, I'm using the terminologies in Wiener amalgam space because Wiener was using these spaces already. C0 is exactly the C0 that you know already. That's the continuous function, which is meant to be locally, which means I'm measuring with the supnorm, which means I'm measuring this. I take the supnorm, but you can also say it's the area of the rectangle of the upper Riemann sum. And then globally, I take the L1 norm. So this is a, a function space that I can define. Uh, and it's made such that it's, of course, inside L1. Kind of all these functions are Riemann integrable, therefore they are Lebesgue integrable. Uh, and, uh, but they contain some functions which are not in the Fourier algebra. And so some, any, any continuous function with compact support which is not in the Fourier algebra, and such functions exist, is found there. It's kind of, it's not so easy to see here, but, uh, but it's, this is all, all correct. And so we can have the dual space, the, the point is you can have the dual space of these things here. So again, we have reflected it. This would be the so-called translation bounded measures. Uh, this, this will be discussed in detail also, just to, because I wanted to have these pictures uh, in, your, in your mind. These are the measures where you would say they may be unbounded measures, but when you measure them on an interval, that's a measure on this interval, but if you move over the interval, it's always the same it's the same, you the same control. So take constant one. Is constant one, or you would say the Riemann integral or the Lebesgue integral, is this a bounded measure? Of course not. We cannot integrate arbitrary bounded functions with respect to that measure. If you take constant one over an interval of a fixed length, whatever the position is, that's controlled. You give me any LP function, I would say, can I control that, that integral? Well, the integral from x to x plus a is integral of f against the indicator function. We use Hölder inequality. The indicator function is certainly in the, in, the, in, the, in the dual space. So it's essentially, yes, the integral or the total mass is 
at most uh, the LP norm times the length of the interval to the exponent 1 over p prime. So it's just Hölder's inequality shows that every LP function is in this territory. So somehow you would say, okay, that might be a good thing. Let's discuss this winner space in great detail. Then all the LP spaces are contained. Uh, another thing I have to tell you. Why did I choose this symbol for the winner space? Obviously, locally, it's like, like uh, the continuous function, which are in C0. Local means near the y-axis in my terminology. So horizontal line means C0. So locally, this is C0. Globally, you see that's towards left and right. It's like L1. So this idea of distinguishing between local and global properties is something that comes in, which I think is quite, quite important. So the Wiener algebra is uh, local C0, global L1. The dual space is global <laughs> like the measures, and the measures are more or less like L1. They are, uh, I mean, the, the bounded measures and L1 are, are contained in each other as, as subspaces. That's why we have this sharp edge here, but in a stretched way. But globally, it's like C0. And C0 is like L infinity, so that's why you have this shape. So would you think that this space is Fourier invariant, either the green one or the outer boundary? You look at it and say, no, it's not Fourier invariant. So the point is, can you have something which is Fourier invariant? And the answer is, yes, this will be the S0 space. So in terms of picture, so that you have an idea where we are going, and not, not not today or so, but is I will try to explain. There is a typo here. The P is wrong. Uh, unfortunately, as you just see now, I will show you there is a nice space. Uh, I don't know if I have another one. No. Uh, so if you think of Schwartz, that would be inside the red area. And if you think of temper distribution, it would be far outside. But this is apparently a space now, which is rotation invariant, like L2. And rotation invariant really means you can not only rotate by 90 degree, but by any angle. And for those who have heard about the fractional Fourier transform, this is really a parameterized group of unitary transformations of L2. You can say Hermit multipliers, multipliers with unit phase uh, in the Hermit basis or so. All these function spaces are really invariant under these things. So I've seen a lot of literature recently. I've studied a lot of literature about fractional Fourier transform. And they usually say, yes, we can define it, maybe for Schwartz function or for L1 functions. Yes, and if the, Fourier the fractional Fourier transform is in L1, we can come back. And I'm asking myself, well, there are now not just one angle, but infinitely many angles. How can one find out whether a given function has a fractional Fourier transform which is integrable? What should one do if it's not integrable or so? With this, it's clear. You try to reduce everything to that subspace. There, it, everything is fine and things go. Okay. So um, just for more or less for further orientation, to go back to the classical domain, blue is L1, red is Fourier algebra now. So yellow is the intersection. I would call that the domain of the Fourier inversion theorem. So in this place, you can uh, apply the Fourier inversion theorem. Clearly, uh, L2 is contained in this space. S0 is, on the other hand, inside this yellow. And uh, outside, you would have a 0 prime. Uh, just another little thing, because we were discussing House of Young a little bit. Uh, I'm using some m more general amalgam spaces. So you could say I'm dividing the interval, again, from n to n plus 1, or in the, in the plane, into little squares or so. I'm taking locally. L1 norms and globally L2 norms. This is more or less the largest space that you can have, which is actually containing all the LP spaces with P between 1 and 2. But locally, it's the biggest among them. It's L1 in the scale from L1 to L2. The L1 is the biggest. Globally, among the LP con little LP spaces, the smallest, uh, the largest, sorry, is L2. Little L1, have we have seen, is inside LP, is inside L2. So I'm choosing locally and globally, but independently, not, not in, a, in a, the small space. So what is the correct symbol for such a space? Uh, it's locally 
Uh, okay, I, I, I was plotting it in the background, the green guy here, but we couldn't see it. So if I rotate it, so what is f of this? So something which is like L1 locally rotated, that's this peak here. What's globally, it's L2, but because I rotate this, the round circle is here. <laughs> so I had to choose when I want to show you in pictures again that this is contained in L2 locally, global C0, and I was making this comment when you were proving it, uh, that actually by splitting an LP function, it's, it's clear that it must be local L2. But this even shows you it must be local in L2, but if you measure a local piece and you move it, it doesn't matter where you measure. It's not like the L2 room is small here and it's getting bigger as you move but it's uniformly controlled and if you m so kind of the energy in an interval is constrained and if you go to infinity you still have some effect of riemann lebesgue type it's going to c0 so for me now again clearly l1 is inside this space so fl1 is inside this space but we have this picture but everything the main point is everything is happening within s0 prime so i don't need schwartz theory to define an extended fourier transform if you know it, I don't do anything, anything different. Uh, but I can do it on groups or Schwartz theory, as I mentioned, is very, very delicate. Now, uh, let me see. Yeah, these are the explanations I have already given. And uh, maybe I try to summarize things that we have already seen. Yeah, I think we should stop now. Yeah. yeah. I will just recall in my terminology what we have seen already. We have seen that L1 is a Banach algebra, so we can multiply in the sense of convolution. Uh, and it's well adapted to the L1 norm, of course, and it's mapped in an injective way into C0. C0 is, uh, in the sense of the discussion, a C star algebra, of course. L1 is not a C star algebra, it just has involution, which we see here. And uh, so it's an injective mapping into this convolution goes into pointwise multiplication and uh, in, in a nutshell I would say if you look at stretching operator now this str is the area preserving operator this is adapted to the L1 norm so you can convolve two functions either by stretching them first and then uh, so these are really isomet uh, automorphisms they are respecting convolution that's important uh, on the other hand, if you take the pointwise multiplication, it's good with pointwise multiplication and that can be the Fourier algebra that's just all the Fourier transforms with the norm that they take with them from the L1 norm. So an element in the Fourier algebra is coming from a uniquely determined L1 function. So the norm in the Fourier algebra of a function f hat is just the norm that it has here. So somehow it's like Somebody is giving you a set which is bijectively mapped from some nice structured set into another set. We, we take the Fourier transform and then because of convolution going to Poitras multiplication, you transfer all the structure and you get the Banach algebra now with multiplication. And, uh, and of course, uh, the other thing is when you are multiplying and you shift. So if you are asking, well, what happens if I shift f times g? And, uh, yeah, well, what happens if I shift f times g? And of course you can say, well, I'm shifting f and I'm shifting g and then I multiply it. So in the pointwise sense, it's clearly a, an, an operator. Therefore, if you translate it back, a modulation operator, which is a frequency shift on the Fourier transform side, is just, uh, again, a family of automorphisms. So you have these rules when you apply either a modulation operator or a stretching operator on the convolution product, then you can do it on both sides. And the other thing is, of course, if you do a translation operator, then you have to do it on one side. So shift of a convolution product is shifting one, one part or the other part or the convolution product. But this will be the theme of, 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 of the second part anyway, so I think we can stop here. Thank you very much.